tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of Thanksgiving-themed frightening fiction about demented dinners and malevolent mishaps. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of The Vespers Bell and Sean Robitill are voice talents Jesse Cornett, Heather Thomas, Justine Anastasia, and Nick Goroff. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first story tonight is written by the Vespers Bell and performed by Jesse Cornett and Heather Thomas. In it, we will meet a couple spending an unusual Thanksgiving together with many things to be thankful and unthankful for. Without further ado, I present to you Freedom From Want. The lavish banquet that had been so expertly laid out on the long, elegant refractory table before me could only be described as perfect. Truly, utterly, perfect. It was the most sublimely archetypal Thanksgiving dinner that I could imagine. The table was draped in a red velvet cloth and adorned with white doilies. All the cutlery and serving dishes were hand-polished sterling silver. All the drinking goblets were dazzling prismatic crystal and all the dining plates were gold-trimmed antique porcelain, passed down from generation to generation, longer than anyone could say for certain. Despite all of that, the food itself still managed to be the most coveted thing before me. It was still steaming hot, its beckoning aroma wafting upwards and unbidden towards me as though trying to lure me in. There was garlic mashed potatoes, mashed turnip, buttered peas and carrots, creamed asparagus, stuffing, giblet gravy, hot rolls, sweet bread, cranberry sauce, pumpkin pie, and a literal cornucopia overflowing with fresh fruit and candy. And of course, the centerpiece was a stuffed turkey, the biggest one I had ever seen. Tantalizing, isn't it? The girl in the dress asked from the opposite end of the table. I knew who she was, and I knew her name, but I shall only be referring to her as the girl in the dress. It was both proper and expected that I would be accompanied by a girl in a dress upon such an occasion. And as far as I was concerned, it could have been any girl in a dress. 
How I wished she was just some random girl in a dress. Tantalizing in the sense that your situation is reminiscent of the mythical Tantalus. Wouldn't you agree? The girl in the dress continued, this time failing to suppress a sadistic little smirk. I wasn't sure how long it'd been since I had last eaten, only that I was ravenously hungry. Probably the hungriest I had been in my entire life. And yet, the sumptuous feast before me was just out of reach. As the girl in the dress had bound me to the chair with chains made from the same fine silver that glistened on the table before me. I had sat there, helplessly watching as she set the table with meticulous and seemingly obsequious care, making multiple trips to and from the kitchen with an adorable little cart. The turkey she had brought out last, it taking all of her strength to hoist onto the table. You really went to so much trouble just to torment me. I asked hoarsely. My throat was parched, which made sense as I hadn't had anything to drink in some time either. But for some reason, either the situation itself or something else she had done to me, the hunger was much more prominent in my mind. Compared to everything else I've ever done for you, this was no trouble at all. She replied glibly. A grandfather clock in another room softly chimed the hour though I didn't bother to count the bells. Oh, good. Dinner time. Food's getting cold, dear. Carve the turkey so we can eat. <clears throat> now you suggest I do that, dear. <clears throat> I sneered at her clattering my restraints against the mahogany armrests of the chair I was in, wondering if maybe I could pull hard enough to break the wood. It doesn't matter. Thanksgiving dinner is a ritual steeped in antiquated traditions. I upheld my end, spent hours making everything from scratch, and all you have to do is carve the damn turkey. She hissed vehemently through her teeth. But, per our usual, all my hard work goes unappreciated, while you can't even fulfill the most trivially token of your obligations. And also, per usual, I expect you have an excuse, rather than an apology, yes? <laughs> You've literally chained me to a goddamn chair. <laughs> I roared. No, you see. That's the wrong answer. She claimed. You're going to have a lot of time to just sit there and think. And what I want you to think about is whether it's really my fault for putting you through this or your fault for driving me to this in the first place. I spat at her. It wasn't hard, considering my mouth held an overabundance of saliva as a result of the bounty of mouth-watering food, but my projectile fell short of its target. And that's why I went with the refractory table, even though it's just the two of us. She smirked smugly placing her chin onto her folded hands. We were both silent for a long while after that. I decided that there was no point in wasting energy on screaming and threatening her. It would be futile and any display of impotent rage would likely only amuse her. I wouldn't beg either. Not for food 
Not for freedom. Not for anything. And it would be just as futile as threatening her. And far more humiliating. No. Instead, I focused on turning my arms back and forth in the hope of using the chains to saw through the wooden arms of the chair enough for me to break them. That's all it would take. Me breaking out of the chair to put an end to her little power fantasy and remind her who was boss. The chair was just ordinary wood. It really seemed like I should have had the strength to break it, especially if it was potentially a matter of life and death. But I was weak with hunger, and the hungrier I got, the weaker I got. My limbs lacked nearly all of their usual strength and felt like wet noodles hanging limply from my torso. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't muster any strength in them. Not that I was actually trying all that hard. The feast in front of me made it hard to focus on anything else. I thought that I could ignore it easily enough. The simple sensory saturation would soon render it an obscure background detail. But I was wrong. As my hunger grew, the feast seemed to grow with it. The food more sumptuous, the portions more decadent, and every moist, succulent morsel glistening in the candlelight. It was still warm somehow, which made me wonder how long I had actually been there. I forced myself to look away from the glorious meal before me for just a few seconds to see if I could spot anything that might give some indication of the passage of time. I glanced towards the window, but the curtains were drawn, and I couldn't really remember what time of day it had been to start with anyway. I looked around for a clock, but found none. Instead, what I saw was a painting hung behind the girl in the dress depicting a mid-20th century American family sitting down to a holiday dinner, albeit one which was austerely meager compared to the one in front of me now. Do you recognize it? The girl in the dress asked. What? I asked groggily, unsure what she was even talking about. The painting... She clarified, pointing behind her. It's Freedom from Want by Norman Rockwell. I chose it very specifically because I think freedom from want is exactly your problem. I don't believe you've ever had any non-trivial desire that has ever gone unfulfilled. Which is why you're incapable of appreciating anything. You need to learn gratitude. Which is what this holiday is all about, after all. You are going to want this food in front of you more than you've ever wanted anything. And when I'm convinced that you're truly capable of appreciating what I've made, of appreciating me, and everything I've done for you, then you can have some. Maybe. I slumped my head then, in the hopes of falling asleep and that sleep might see some of my proper strength return to me. I was tired, there was no denying that. Exhausted even, and yet my weariness was nothing when compared to the hunger. The hunger would not allow me to sleep. It obstinately demanded that I satisfy it, and in doing so deprived me of the strength I needed to oblige it. It was a hell of a catch-22, to be sure. The hunger gnawed away at me from the inside, deciding that if I couldn't feed it, then it would feed upon me instead. 
I could feel the overproduction of acid start to dissolve my stomach walls, burning ulcers growing like cancer as the scorching bile shot up into my throat and dribbled out of my mouth. My innards growled and spasmed, sending waves of hunger pains radiating throughout my body. I was thrown into convulsions, and I dared to hope that these paroxysms might finally give me the strength I needed to break free of the chair, even if they had to break my bones in the process. My bones did break. I know because I saw their jagged bloody ends sticking out of my mangled appendages. Despite this, I still could not wiggle loose from my chains, nor did I manage to break the arms of the chair. I was probably in the most pain I had ever been in my life, and yet somehow it was still insignificant compared to my exceptionally growing hunger. I was stewing in my own urine and excrement at this point, of course. <laughs> But it had been some time since I had last evacuated my insides. My bodily stores must have been spent, I assumed. But this sparked a sudden realization in my sleep-deprived, dehydrated, hunger-ravaged brain. The girl in the dress had once left the table in all that time. She had not yet taken any food or drink still insisting that I be the one to cut the turkey. Nor had she slept or gone to use the restroom. And yet she still looked as picture perfect as she had when the whole ordeal started. It was the same with the food. It must have been days. It had to have been days, but the food was still warm and fresh and enticing as it ever had been. This isn't real. I groaned. This can't be real. The food wouldn't still be like this if it had been sitting out for this long. You can't have been sitting there this whole time without eating or sleeping or shitting yourself. Watch your tongue, dear. It's Thanksgiving. She gently scolded me. It's not fucking Thanksgiving. It's probably not even still fucking November anymore. I screamed. It was then that I heard the sound of Westminster chimes as the grandfather clock in the other room signaled that it was now a quarter past the hour. And to my horror, I had realized that this was the first time I had heard it since dinner had started. What are you babbling about? It's only been 15 minutes, you big baby. She taunted me. But dinner is getting cold, and I'm getting hungry. So carve the turkey so that we can eat. No. <laughs> No, that's impossible. I murmured, the state of my body a testament to the fact that I had been bound there for days. And yet, the girl in the dress, the food on the table, and the chiming of the grandfather clock all stood testament to the fact that I had not. How? Oh. I asked, more to myself than to the girl in the dress. I could think of no explanation for the gaping contradiction before me, nor did my hostess offer one. The horrifying implications of this paradox were obvious to me, even in my famished and exhausted state. If what felt like days to me were just minutes to her, then how long would she be able to keep me here? I got my answer soon enough. I was well past the point where I should have died of dehydration and yet I continued to starve. 
I should have been hallucinating from the lack of sleep, and yet my hunger kept me lucid. The hunger, along with its effects on my mind and body, were distorting my experience of time. And the stronger my hunger grew, the more distorted time became. I sat there helplessly as my body wasted away to a mummified skeleton over what felt like weeks to me, only to break down into tears when I heard the Westminster chimes once again, letting me know that it was now half past the hour. The hungrier I got, the slower time moved which meant I would probably be in a seemingly perpetual state of endless starvation without ever actually dying. Though my salvation was within arm's reach, I could not move my arms. I lacked the strength to even struggle against the chains now, and I feared that even if they were removed, I wouldn't have the strength to feed myself anyway. Do you think that's enough then? The girl in the dress asked. If I unchain you, will you actually be grateful for once? For the food, for your freedom, for your life. For me. Just say it. If you can't say you're sorry and mean it, say how much you need me. Say how grateful you are to have had me in your life. And then beg, beg me for help. I might do it. Considering my severe state of bodily degradation, I knew that I would likely only be able to muster a couple of words. I think she realized that as well. With that in mind, I chose those two words very carefully. <laughs> Fuck. You. <laughs> I coughed. Without warning, she slammed her hands down on the table, and for the first time since she had sat down, stood up from her chair. You absolute fucking bastard! Why can't you let me have this? She demanded, angry tears now rolling down her hot cheeks. I literally offer you a feast when you're fucking starving, and you still can't appreciate me. I'm trying to help you, trying to make you a better person, and you still don't fucking care. You're not the one chained to a chair. <coughs> I forced myself to wheeze out. If I'm so much trouble, leave. <laughs> Her face contorted wildly then, as if I had somehow just stabbed her through the heart. The angry tears gave way to ones of unadulterated sorrow, and without saying another word, she sat back down in her chair, then began sobbing into her hands. It was then that the chains holding me in place finally slackened and clattered to the floor, and whatever sort of spell I had been under was broken. I was, at long last, free to slake my hunger. But as I reached towards the table, my hopes of gorging myself upon a bountiful feast were cruelly snatched away. Now that my experience of time was in sync with realities again, it seemed that some toll needed to be exacted. The food which had remained miraculously preserved for so long now looked like it had been sitting out for weeks, swarming with flies and swimming with maggots. 
Everything was discolored and desiccated and smothered with hideous mold. A fetid reek of rot hung heavily in the air, slowly creeping out and infusing its stench into anything it came into contact with. And as I shoved the first handful of rancid, moldy, maggot-ridden turkey into my mouth, I felt thankful. I hope you enjoyed Freedom from Want, as written by the Vespers Bell and voiced by Jesse Cornett and Heather Thomas. To find more of author The Vespers Bell, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash The Vespers Bell, spelled T-H-E-V-E-S-P-E-R-S-B-E-L-L, and you'll be redirected to his author profile on creepypastastories.com. And if you enjoyed Mr. Cornette's performance, you can hear more of him on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel, as well as on the No Sleep podcast, where you can hear his vocal performances as well as production. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by Sean Robitill and performed by Nick Goroff and Justine Anastasia. In it, a young man returning home for the holidays crashes his car and ends up lost in the woods. He doesn't realize he stumbled into an area known for strange disappearances with creatures that don't like the light. Now, without further ado, I present to you The Storm. The snow came down in thick, wet flakes bigger than anything James had ever seen. He wasn't worried about ice on the road as the temperature hadn't dropped below freezing, but the slush and thick snow were beginning to pile up, forcing him to slow his car to a crawl, not to mention his low visibility. I'm glad I sprung for the snow tires rather than the all seasons, James said under his breath. When he left his apartment in Boston that morning, it was clear and beautiful, with no bad weather mentioned in the forecast. But just before dark, a classic nor'easter had blown up the coast, and just as he was almost home, it hit hard. James might have been lost. He knew he was somewhere between Stowe and Bakersfield on the north side of Smuggler's Notch in Vermont, but he wasn't entirely sure where. He had been taking back roads for a long time, trying to avoid other traffic and any wrecks that may clog up the roads, but now it was dawning on him that he hadn't seen another car or a house in a very long time. It's going to be fine, he said to himself, lighting a cigarette. I'll get there late, but Mom and Dad will be happy to see me. James' parents had been excited for weeks that he was coming home from college for the holidays. His mother had been making a huge meal all day from what she told him that morning over the phone, and he hadn't eaten since breakfast in anticipation of his first home-cooked meal in months. Looking at his dash clock, he swore out loud. 10.38, you have got to be kidding me he said in anger. Rolling his window down to flick his ash, he looked to his left out the window, just as he saw in his peripheral vision a figure in the road before him. James panicked, mashing his brakes hard, glad he had ripped the anti-lock feature out over the summer until the car slid sideways and into a ditch. He sat stunned for close to forty seconds, then panicked and shaking, he swung his door open and stepped out into the falling snow and knee-high drifts. The night was silent, almost no wind on the deserted back road. Trees hemmed in James, and the branches stretched overhead and dropped thick piles of snow here and there. He leaned back into the car and pulled the large flashlight out of the glove box he kept for situations like this. He ran back toward where the figure had been in the road and... Finding where his car's tracks had begun to slide, traced back to where the figure should have been. 
He was surprised to find not deer prints as he suspected, but what he assumed had to be left by a human in boots or shoes. Hello? He yelled loudly, scanning around himself with a flashlight. The tracks came from one side of the woods, stopped in the middle of the road where his car tracks met them, then continued off into the woods on the other side of the road. No blood, he noted, thank God, and no sign of change in the track pattern. Maybe he had missed them, he considered. Is anybody out there? James yelled again into the woods. It was quiet enough, he should have heard someone. If you can hear me, make a noise. Do you need help? James strained his ears, and after a few seconds, he heard very faint, just on the wind, crying. I can hear you, he yelled into the woods. I'm going to call for help, then I'll be right there, he added. Shaking, James ran back to his car, flipped open the center drawer and grabbed his phone. No service. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, he exclaimed in frustration, before he saw the text at the bottom. Outside service range emergency calls only. Oh, thank God, he said, dialing emergency services while he hurried back to the spot the tracks met. 911, what's your emergency? He heard a man's voice. I, um, I think I hit someone. I need to find them. I can hear them. Sir, where are you located? Came the voice. I'm not really sure. I think I'm close to Bakersfield. James paused, frustrated at what little help he was. It's okay, sir. If you stay where you are, we can triangulate your cell phone signal. James had an idea. A way to be helpful. Okay, I'm going to set my phone on the ground and go find the person I hit, he said. Before the operator could respond, he set his phone down on the edge of the road. Scanning the ditch with his flashlight, he saw nothing. Tracing the tracks, he could see that they went into the woods between the trees. Hello! he shouted. I need you to keep making noise so that I can hear you! Again, he heard the low sobbing, like last time, just on the edge of his hearing, just barely audible. Well, I suppose I should go find them, he said reluctantly, and jumped across the ditch into the tracks, and began following the tracks between the trees into the woods. He could still hear the operator desperately trying to reach him over his phone, but couldn't make out the details. He was more focused on the sobbing. As he walked, it seemed to fade in and out and change directions. That's just a trick of the wind, he told himself. If I stick to following the tracks, I'll find them. He yelled again. Don't worry, I'm coming! Stumbling through the snow and buried logs and sticks, he had tripped a few times before realizing he could no longer hear his phone. Stopping, he looked around. How far into the woods had he gone? How far did this person walk into the woods? Were they still walking? Looking back, he couldn't see any light from his headlights. He couldn't see any sign of the road. He still heard the sobbing, and was considering going back and waiting for the first responder until he heard it, faint but just louder than the sobbing, almost a weak mumble like the person was having trouble speaking. Please, help. It was definitely a woman's voice. Hang on, lady. I'm coming, he yelled back, choosing to keep going after her deeper into the woods. Mike was waiting at the scene when the police arrived. It was the same as always. Every few years, they would find a car abandoned on this stretch of road. No sign of injury or what made them crash. Nothing. Only one set of tracks leading off into the woods. The same every time. And always, a college-age man came back as the registration. What do we got? The responding officer asked, walking up to the scene with his partner. Mike looked at him skeptically. Come on, Ralph. This ain't the first or second time we've seen this exact scene over our 25 years working together. This is the... Ralph asked. This is the goddamn seventh time. 
Seven times in 25 years. Same spot, same details, Ralph. What are you going to do about this? Ralph returned to his cruiser an hour later with his partner, Todd. They had collected all the information to make a case file and bagged or photographed what little evidence they could find. James was still walking, but now more frantic. And he didn't dare stop, even though he was out of breath and on the verge of collapse. He hadn't eaten since the morning, and now he was regretting everything about his trip back home. The crying had gotten louder and louder over the last hour, until it had turned to screaming and eventually <laughs> laughing. It was all around him now, the laughter. He couldn't escape it. He had turned around to go back to his car finally, around the time the screaming started to turn to laughter, only his trail was gone. When James turned around, he found nothing but fresh snow. No tracks, nothing. The screaming had stopped then. He stood for moments in dead silence, pondering how this would make any sense. He turned in place, 360 degrees, yet found nothing. No tracks in any direction. He realized how lost he was now so far into the woods and began to cry. <laughs> That's when the laughter started, <laughs> quiet and faint at first, but it grew louder and louder all around him, a woman's loud, maniacal laughter. He bolted from his place at a dead sprint, flashlight waving all around him, never daring to look back or slow down, all the while the laughter pounding in his ears. Now he ran stumbling with the bit of energy he had left panting, struggling through the snow. Finally, when he could take no more, he collapsed. Gathering a few large breaths, he screamed at the top of his lungs. Stop! Please stop! All at once, the laughter stopped. James rose to his feet. The forest was silent. The snow had stopped at some point. Just at the edge of his hearing, he could make out a voice in front of him. Scanning ahead with his flashlight, he saw something shining a few yards ahead of him. James gathered his courage and stepped forward through the snow. Even pushing through the snow didn't make a noise, so he was surprised when he heard noises all around him. He tried to focus on the voice in front of him as he walked forward, but he could hear what was clearly multiple things circling him. He scanned with his flashlight, but the beam was growing dull and yellow and didn't penetrate very far ahead anymore. Whatever was out there was smart enough to stay out of range of the light. He shook the flashlight and it got brighter, but only for a few moments. After a few more steps, he heard the voice clearer at his feet. He bent down and began to dig through the snow. He could listen to the circling around him just out of sight, and he dug faster until he struck something solid and small. Pulling it up into the light, it was his phone. He stood and looked all around. He wasn't on the road. He was still deep in the forest. Thinking back, he clearly remembered leaving it at the edge of the road for the first responders to find. How could this be? He looked all around sweeping the dull yellow beam and was absolutely sure this was not the road. Looking down, he could see the phone was still in an active call with someone. He pulled the phone slowly to his ear and spoke soft and scared. He Hello? He questioned in fear. He listened intently and heard nothing. His flashlight began to get weaker, fading slowly and he could hear the things circling him get closer as the light faded, but still stayed just out of the range of the lights. Hello? He said into the phone again. Finally, a woman's voice responded. Hello? Oh, thank God, James said, and began to babble as his light was fading and the circling was getting closer. He could now hear the breathing of the small animals all around him. I need you to... Send someone to find me. 
sorry I wandered off, but I'm lost now, and I think I'm being circled by coyotes. The voice spoke to him calmly and reassuringly. It's okay, James. James froze in his tracks. He began to sob uncontrollably. He had initially called a male operator, and he hadn't told them his name. The woman continued on as James' flashlight grew weaker and weaker, and the circling got closer and closer. It's okay. We know exactly where you are, James. In fact, we can see you now. James began waving his flashlight around, looking all about him while sobbing quietly. As the light began to die out for good, she added, We don't like the light, James, so it will be the first thing we take from you. I hope you enjoyed The Storm, as written by Sean Robitil and voiced by Nick Goroff and Justine Anastasia. Voice actor and 2016 Evil Idol champion Nick Goroff's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as on past episodes of the Simply Scary podcast. You can also join Nick on his YouTube channel, Wizard of Cause. If you drop by, don't forget to let him know you heard him here on this show. And as a reminder, you can hear more of Justine Anastasia right here on our official YouTube channel. She also has written for the show, as well as being one of the judges for the 2019 Evil Idol voice acting competition. Be sure to let them know you heard them here. You won't be sorry that you did. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight, wish you a spooky holiday, and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. We're so very thankful for you. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>